Today on the Pro Life Podcast, Dr. Jones, not the one who digs up stuff in the desert, but he does fight Nazis. Dr. Stephen Jones to talk about why the facts maybe should care a little bit about your feelings. Pull up a chair, grab your coffee. Let's get started. Happy Tuesday, pro-life family. Grab your coffee, pull up a chair. We have an awesome guest today. Dr. Stephen Jones is joining us. We, uh, well, before I introduce, we'll get to the rest of the group. Kim Schwartz, Media Communications Director. Emily Cook, General Counsel. Brent Collierman, IT Director. Dr. Jones, happy to have you on the program. Good to be here. Happy to, happy to have you in the circle of friends now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, this is a really interesting topic to discuss. Um, rhetoric in the pro-life movement and why it's important. Yep. Why is rhetoric important? Yeah, it's a it's a question that I get a lot. Like I uh, I come from a background where I studied in you know, the ancient world and and Greek and Latin and things like that, and I ended up getting getting a job as a rhetoric professor. And people always come to me and, and ask, um, you know, I have the facts on my side. Why isn't mm -hmm. uh, why isn't that enough? And realizing that um, how you present an argument, how you uh, frame it is is almost like a it's almost like a chef right you uh, a chef doesn't say i have great ingredients on my side i i can just dump them on the table no the chef prepares the chef organizes the chef structures that makes and, so much sense yeah and presents it in a way that's easily digestible and acceptable and so that's why i tell people about rhetoric like how can i um how can mm. i help you not see that see the, the the dark side of rhetoric is um people trying to make the weaker argument stronger and things like that or to make something look presentable that's not Mm -hmm. um, that's not what this is about, but how can I help you um, take the truth and present it in a way that's easily understandable? Definitely. Okay. I was watching a video the other day that was talking about how the right has biological facts on our side on so many issues, especially abortion. But the left has considered like, OK, well, even if, you know, most of Americans know, OK, that's not just a clump of cells that we're throwing away. We know that this is a baby and that this is valuable. But the left has convinced everyone that it's more compassionate. It's just nicer to uh, allow abortion at any time and for any reason. And so that's why it's important not just to say like, here are the facts, here are the facts, here are the facts. We do have those on our side, but you have to actually get down to the root of what is actually an abortion and is that really compassionate? What is the uh, your opponent actually trying to say? Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe even, you know, when you use the words like opponent, it, it underscores maybe the point that you have to first start off with when you think about rhetoric and argument and presenting a presenting a debate. And it really is what your goal is. Um, when you frame it in terms of political discourse or public square dialogue, so many times we focus on winning an argument. And what that means is scoring points or making people look silly. Um, and we hate it when that's done to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and you have to kind of ask yourself, uh, what is my goal here? And ultimately, I think the goal needs to be trying to win somebody over to your side. I mean, that's the that's the goal. I, I don't want you just to accept that I'm right. I want you to join my side. Right. And that's kind of the goal. Um, but but when you realize most of our public discourse on social media and other places like that is just circling the wagon, shouting slogans, belittling the other side, and trying to score as many points as possible. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's that's sort of the tension you have to ask yourself. What are you trying to do here? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and honestly, are you willing to 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 give to the other person what you're asking from them? Which is, um, are you open to real, honest dialogue? You want to you want them to change their mind? Are you open to having your mind changed? You might think you have the facts, but are you? You can't extend. You can't demand from someone else a willingness to change. Right. If you're not open to the same fact, I think I have all the facts on my side, but I'm I'm going to be honest enough to say I'm I'm and humble enough to say I could be wrong about this. Let me let me hear what you have to say, and maybe you can hear what I have to say as well. Hmm. Yeah, so. I appreciate this. I appreciate this topic because it is how do the facts tell a story, and mm -hmm. that's you, you to be a successful lawyer. That's what you're trying to convince everybody of all <laughs> yeah. the time. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, the, I should have gone with the lawyer argument instead of the chef argument earlier because, <laughs> because you can have all the law, all, all the all the facts on your side, and still lose the case because right. you haven't presented it in exactly. a way that that makes sense to a jury. Right, it's an art. Right, exactly right. And so one of the things I talk about is in rhetoric that's so helpful is um, the idea of three kinds of persuasion, 
or three kinds of uh, categories of argument. And and the one that's really categorized as facts, they have fancy Greek words and they're wonderful. Uh, one, the first is logos. Um, the idea that um, that here are all here's the data. We get the word logical from it. Okay. And um, a lot of times when you have the logos on your side, you think that's enough because it seems so compelling to you. I mean, in my world, it makes sense. I'm the techie. Like, <laughs> da data is data. It's, it's the data. <laughs> exactly right. And but eventually, someone goes, "You have your data. I have my data. What? How do we rank this? And how do we how do we organize it? How do we prioritize it? All of a sudden, you have to tell a story. Um, there's data about the data, and that's where you get the other other modes. You know, Aristotle and other other philosophers talked about this. There's not just logos. There's also the next level is ethos. We get the word ethical from it. And maybe you you have the word ethos about how somebody like presents themselves. And ethos is about your credibility. Why should I listen to you? Um, what what makes you an expert on this subject? Why why should you be involved in this debate? What right do you have to speak? Um, your ethos is so important. And then the last part is something that you hit on um, is pathos. Um, pathos, we get the word pathetic or sympathy. And it means to suffer alongside somebody. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it talks about how, um, are you emotionally invested? Why does this matter? What is the compassionate side of this? Uh, do you, uh, are you able to tell a story that's meaningful? Because a lot of people have this, have this, have the, um, the experience of having facts and not caring. Like we, they go to school all the time, they get cat facts and like, right. you feel like a cold, sterile person and like, this doesn't affect my life in any way. And so I'm done, I don't, I don't care. Like one of the most important questions you can ever ask about anything, not just about this, but about any talk you give or about any presentation is so what? Mm -hmm. I believe you, I don't care. Why should this matter to me? Right. And so trying to trying to frame it in, okay, I have the logos, now what is what about ethos? And now what about pathos? Wow. Yeah, definitely. I think that's so important, especially because, you know, you have so many people who, whenever you start having these conversations, you can you maybe can convince them that life begins at conception. But then the next step is, okay, well, I know that abortion is killing, but I don't care. Or why does that make it wrong? Why the, the fundamental question after you uh, convince somebody that life does begin at conception is, is that life valuable, equally valuable to the woman who is pregnant? Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Like that's the, uh, most of the problems that people have in these sorts of, of, of engagements are, the story that connects with people are those pathos charged stories. Oh yeah. And there, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's easy to tell a story that's not the whole story, right? Or it's easy to tell yeah. one side of the story. Um, you know, the idea that there are a lot of, you know, people find themselves in crisis pregnancies for a lot of unfortunate and challenging and difficult situations. Mm -hmm. And when you just come in and dump all of this logos about, about the, about the, 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 you know, philosophical status or the, or the ethical status, the moral status of the unborn, then all of a sudden it feels like you're just jettisoning this, all this other stuff that you don't care, you're a heartless person. And so learning to connect is essential. Learning, learning to frame and to present the logos in a way that, that shows that you're a credible steward of it and that you are a, a feeling human being as well is so important. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Mm -hmm. How can we use this stuff to have productive conversations like, Whenever my neighbor challenges me on my pro-life beliefs and I don't know how to respond, what is? How can I start putting this into practice? Um, well, that's a it's a great question. First, I would um, I always tell people, you know, it's you're so tempted when you when you when you have the facts on your side. It's a, a, a lawyer friend of mine once said, when you have the facts on your side, argue the facts. But when you don't have the facts on your side, you you argue argue the client or you argue the law or sometimes you just pound the table, right? <laughs> and and sometimes in an argument, people just want to pound the table, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, the first reason, so un understanding your goal, understanding, okay, I, I want to win this person over. So the first thing I'm gonna do is gonna connect with this person. Mm -hmm. And so instead of going going toe to toe, going fact for fact, let me let me connect with them on a pathos level. Let me show them I care. There's an old, it's a hokey saying, but it's actually true. And it's people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Right. Yep. And and so connect with them on a pathos level. Like that, that that's a hard place to be. Um, and then talk, and then move from pathos to ethos. Um, let me tell you why I think I can make a meaningful con con contribution to the situation. Because um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of ways in which we don't understand the uh, the ethos obstacles to us engaging with other people. Um, you know, trying to present your credibility is so important. Why should you listen to me? You know, oh, you you know, the, so many times the the pro life movement is has been uh, represented by the people who are the worst carriers of the logos, the guy with with the van with the gruesome images on the outside mm -hmm. who drives around. That those are true statements, and and you need to see this. But 
maybe this isn't maybe that's not the the most eth the most you know ethos present and so mm -hmm. trying to establish your ethos and maybe even understanding the ethos objections that people might have to you mm -hmm. right why uh you know what are some common examples of people dismissing uh dismissing uh someone's voice because of ethos right, right. you're a man you're a man you're a religious bigot exactly right though knowing that right knowing that okay you are going to see you are going to see this as as me being religious. So it's one of those, one of those mm -hmm. important ways of how can I frame this? Yeah, I, I have religious convic convictions. I'm not ashamed of those. Um, I'm not embarrassed about that, but let me tell you why I think um, you should care about this too, even if we don't share the same religious convictions. Or let me tell you why I, as a man, um, still have think I have a right to speak into this situation. And there's a lot of different ways you can you can frame those stories. One of the things I tell when someone says this is, I, I feel like I have a right to speak because I am, I am the I'm like an, a twice removed abortion survivor. Like mm -hmm. my my grandmother mm -hmm. was told to abort my mother. Wow. Wow. Okay. And she said uh, the doctor told her you are too you are too sick to carry this baby. You are too poor to give this baby a good life. Mm -hmm. It is it is better. And wow. my grandma said three words. So be it. Wow. And um, I'm not gonna. Wow. Uh, and and I'm I'm and I exist, and my six children exist. There's there there are four generations of a legacy because someone chose life, and I, and, that's, and that's me. Praise awesome. God. Yeah, I know. And you and you go and you go. That's the kind of that's why I feel like I have a right to speak because if someone else hadn't chosen life, I wouldn't be here. Right. Okay. Um, there's also a, a another a colleague of mine that I know that that kind of. Um, engages he's a little bit more abrasive than I am and he was on a on a on a phone call one time phone call interview and his he has a name that has both a masculine and feminine spelling and it can be used for either, and and he just happens his parents didn't know this and they gave him the, the female spelling name oh and he and he and he was on on a debate one time on a phone and the person goes you have no right to speak you're a man he, and, and the person said how how do you know I'm a man nice my my name is spelled like the woman name are you judging by the tone of my voice what Maybe you need to recognize the arguments don't have gender. Yeah. Okay. He he said something a little bit more uh, more abrasive, but <laughs> but um, but that's funny. and but, you can't say no in this day and age. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but that's the thing, right? Um, I have a right to speak as 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 a as specifically as an abortion survivor, or at one of the one of the cool things that's coming out is you know, uh, one of the sad sides of of the pro choice movement has been the the ways in which. This has been framed. Uh, abortion has been framed as independent, as as um, reproductive equality, right? Like when right. the people saying things like, um, like this is going to force people to you know stay in you know anonymous anonymous sex is no longer possible, and that um, people are um, sort of uh, men are pressuring women to have abortions. This is somehow a freedom. Like you can have anonymous sex if a woman has an abortion. Um, right. Men for pro-choice stuff is—it's bizarre. Yeah, it's weird. But wow. what you see on the other side, though, is the beginning idea that I'm a father. Yeah, that's my child too, right? What does it mean? What does it mean to to create a child? Mm -hmm. And and yet there was there was a famous uh, uh, thing that just happened in, in, in last couple of recent years where where a man was like, "No, that's my child too. Please don't." Yeah. Um, I and so fathers have a right to stay. Uh, to stand up and say, there's there's ethos there too as well, and that that's both ethos and pathos, right? Yeah. Nothing will make you want to be a better man faster than mm -hmm. suddenly being dad. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember when my I I always knew intellectually, uh, like I I accepted the logos of that's a separate discrete member of the human species, right? There's a a, a unique mm -hmm. set of DNA. If we're swabbing for DNA on a crime scene, we're going to find two people here. Mm -hmm. I knew that, but nothing changed change my attitude more. And it took it fr not just from my head to my heart, but almost into my guts, right? Just visceral level connection. Then, you know, my wife was pregnant with our first child and she was ex some, experiencing some sensations that, she, that was new to her and didn't know. And so we went for an ultrasound. This was, we we're living in California at the time. And this was at a time when it would have been legally allowed for me to abort this baby. And, um, and they did an ultrasound and I saw this baby moving in my wife's womb and I heard her heartbeat. And there is no story you could tell me mm -hmm. that wouldn't connect, that mm -hmm. wouldn't connect that little baby. I, I heard her heart beating and I saw her flip around in my wife's womb to the to the 16 year old rambunctious person trying to get a driver's license. <laughs> right. There's continuity of there. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just and it transforms you. Yeah. And so g letting that sink down, not just into your heart, but deep down where you keep your guts. And that'll that'll, that'll move you in a way that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for sure. I realized uh, 
I, I was exposed to this on the graduate level one time. I, I encountered this term one time that I, I've since been, it's, it's unfortunate what it means, right? It's the term reproductive equality. You know, and, and I was like, what is it? It sounds like a fair thing. No, it means, you know, if men have the ability to have anonymous consequence free sex, then women should have that same responsibility. I'm like, no, that maybe it's the other way around. Like um, I, I heard it with the recent Supreme Court decision, I heard somebody, you know, lamenting, oh, OK, men, I hope you, um, you know, if a woman can't abandon their pregnancies, then men can't abandon them either. Yes, welcome Woo! to the welcome to the family. <laughs> we discovered the family. Right? That's why it's there. Don't Maybe, tell them. Don't yeah. tell them. Just let them think that yeah. they discovered yeah. it. The reciprocal obligation of two people is is why this needs. That's why God created sex. Sex is for families, and He creates the family, and it needs a family. And that's why the government has a vested interest in in securing the family and holding people to these obligations because it's important. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, like I um. I know you went, one of the things I, I had the privilege of being involved in is is um, a crisis pregnancy center in East Africa. Oh, wow. Nice. And, um, and I was, and I remember going to visit there and, and um, listening to some of the stories that these women are telling about why they're, it's the, the crisis pregnancy center is on the road to one of the leading abortion centers in Kampala. Wow. Okay, women are literally walking to get abortions and they're stopping in to this place wow. and hearing the story of life and choosing life. And um, and I was sitting there listening to all of these traumatic stories and all of them, all of them had one common denominator. I was sitting there going, these women feel the pressure to abort their babies because the men who are the fathers of these children have already aborted their families. The moment you divorce sex from family, the moment you, um, the moment she, a man says, I'm gonna abort this family, I don't want it anymore, then now the woman is in a place where I got to get rid of all, every vestige of this family as well. It's a, it's, a, it's a trickle down effect. Yeah, absolutely. And we can do a whole episode on why it's important for men to be involved in the pro-life movement uh, for so long. It's so it's so interesting to me that the abortion movement has said for so long that men have no place in the abortion discussion. Men should be silent about abortion because it's all about women. And that has backfired on them. And you have seen in recent years, uh, groups like NARAL having events specifically for men saying, we need men to be involved in the abortion discussion. And I don't know what exactly changed there, but I think they realized that, yes, this is important. If you are a human being, then you have an obligation to speak out about human rights. The most foremost is the right to life. Yeah, yeah, definitely agree. Cool. Well, we need to take a quick break here, friends. We have some important information, some events coming up we want to share with you, and we will get back to this topic in just a moment. Save the date for Boots on the Ground. It's an awesome pro-life conference coming up January 28th and 29th. Come to Austin, Texas with us to march to the Capitol, to celebrate the end of Roe v. Wade, to commemorate Roe v. Wade, and to learn from expert pro-life speakers on how to keep Texas pro-life forever. Come to Austin with us and hear from Ryan Bomberger, our keynote speaker who shares his personal story, and so much more. Book your tickets today, bootsonthegroundtx.com. See you in January. The Supreme Court just overturned Roe v. Wade. This is a historic moment. Now we have a bold, groundbreaking agenda for the next steps. First, we have to enforce our laws and make sure liberal district attorneys don't give abortionists a free pass. Second, we need to expand the life-saving alternatives to abortion program. And third, we need to save hospital patients. Do you believe in this vision? Go to texasrighttolife.com stand to donate now and save lives. Welcome back, friends. We're talking with Dr. Stephen Jones. Um, I, I want to talk about you brought up Uganda. How did you get involved in pregnancy centers in Uganda? Well, um, it was through my church. Um, we we had been connected uh, to, we had taken some mission trips over there and started meeting some people who were working with uh, women who were in crisis situations. Mm -hmm. And um, it was brought to our attention that uh, the building that was one of these places we had visited, um, the per person who owned it, was about to kick this crisis pregnancy center out and put in the um, put in the a the leading abortion mm. uh, provider from Europe, right? At Marie Stopes, which is sort of the Europe version of Gosh. Planned Parenthood, and they were going to take this building because the guy made them a better offer. Mm -hmm. And our church was like, "We're we're not going to let this happen." 
And so they raised the money and they bought the building for this this organization. No, no, this is not, we're not going to turn a place that was dedicated to life to be a, and so, and, and. Sea churches, you can always get involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, um, and what, what was interesting is we began then a partnership where we would, um, well, support, we would try to, you know, all of the things that people argue that isn't that, oh, pro-life, you mean just pro-birth. No, no. Mm -hmm. Let, let's start there. Let's start, let's start with, with not having the abortion, but realize that this is about a whole life mm -hmm. and realize that women are in complex, difficult, unfortunate situations. And how can we help a person not just not make a bad decision, but to grow into, see how this could be the beginning of a life maybe they weren't expecting, but which maybe is bigger and, and better than they could possibly imagine. And so to give them like vocational training, give them opportunities, give them the supplies. And the, it's interesting, Uganda is a fascinating place. A women will be turned away from hospitals if they don't not just show up at the hospital, but they have to have, they have to have the supplies they need to deliver the baby with them. Oh, wow. Really? It's called a, okay. it's oh, called, it's called a mama oh kit. And you have to have all the stuff before you can have the baby in a hospital. And so one of the things that our church, this, this place does, it's called the Comforter Center in Kampala. And, um, one of the things they do is they raise money to um, to have to, to to provide these mama kits yeah. for women who because sometimes like it's wow. cheaper to have an abortion That's than to have cool. a baby yeah. because I don't have the stuff. Um, oh my gosh! Yeah. Oh my gosh! Uganda, is, as far as a food food scarcity, is not a problem because it's in a very rich part of Africa, right. and yeah. so they have so calories aren't a problem. They have a, a you know plantain base. The most it's like their equivalent of potatoes. And, and so getting calories isn't important, isn't, isn't a problem, but some women have a hard time getting the nutrients they need. Mm -hmm. And so one of the other things we did was we, um, we, we, we raise, get prenatal vitamins mm -hmm. and just bring them, bring like, oh. I was actually worried going, I showed up at the airport with, with a whole suitcase oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> full of prenatal vitamins in bottles. Like, <laughs> and you know, go to Kroger, buy, buy one, get one free. Okay. Yeah. And I watch, I watch them. So you, they scan it when they leave. So I'm going to the airport and they put, they put on the thing, they send it to the x-ray, x-ray. And there's guys with guns at the other end. Yep. It goes through, it backs up, yep. it yep. stops, and people come over. I'm uh -huh. Like, oh no, what's going uh -huh. on? Spend the night in a Kampala jail. <laughs> then it goes through, and we're totally fine. Oh goodness. But it was it was so cool to say, you know what? Here's uh, you have the calories. Now let's give you the nutrients you need. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so there's also an organization I work with. So that's called the Comforter Center. And then there's there's a partner organization uh, called Heshema Ministries, which Heshema means respect. And it's sort of the the handoff from Comforter Center. Um, Comforter Center is is mainly about counseling women. Look, here is why the abortion isn't the answer. Um, and and tell you what, like the stories. I remember sitting there under the tent outside, listening to these women tell stories about how they came here um, and why they're there. See, um, a lot of people think there's opportunity in city in the big cities in Africa, and so they're flocked to places like Kampala. Kampala is roughly the size of Houston. Um, has the infra like it's, you know, a couple I think it's two two or three million people um, has the infrastructure of Waco um, different and, yeah and and people mm -hmm. who and people who um, have come here because they can make more than in the villages they think there's going to be opportunity but it ends up being radical poverty and and so they're stuck in these slums and they don't know what to do and now they get stuck in a difficult situation they're far away from home oh. and um, so Comforter Center is about let me let me help you not make this decision. And now let's try to find a way to give you what you need to get, have this baby and then have a life. Yeah. And then, so Heshema okay. Ministries is about vocation, train, giving, giving women vocational cool. ministries, a vocational uh, training to help them and their kids get out of poverty. Wow. So, awesome. Yeah. I love it. It's really cool. It's, <laughs> it's, it's exciting stuff um, because, you know, we talk about the, the situations that, um, that, 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 find, that women find themselves in America that are, that are difficult, and they are difficult. Um, some of the stories in Uganda were, that I heard were, you know, a woman had come from South Sudan for a job. She was working as she had a great job for her, which was as a as a housekeeper in a, in a wealthy man's house. She was sexually assaulted by the wealthy man's son. When she told when she told the, her employer, the father sexually assaulted her and kicked her out. She found out she was pregnant. Now she's from South Sudan. She's not Ugandan. So she's a long way from home. She has no money. She discovers she's pregnant. She goes home and she's damaged goods. And so she is stuck. Mm -hmm. She comes back to the one place where she has any sort of, her, her people kick her out and she is walking up the hill to this abortion clinic because she needs her life back. Wow. And, she, and she, walks into, she walks into the comforter center. Yeah. Um, another woman, she, uh, she was uh, you know, 20 and her husband died. She had two kids or she was pregnant with her second kid. 
and uh, her husband died mm -hmm. and she was her 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 family group was forcing her to marry her her husband's brother she refused and so she she left and she was like i don't know what to do i already have one kid i can't support i mean mm -hmm. and she was walking up the road to wow and you know trying to just help them stop ma making this decision and then let me show you why there is hope because ultimately you know i've read studies and, and i've seen it and I've, I've seen it in place in places like that um where most most women who find themselves in radically difficult situations um think that this is the only answer and that there's no hope except for this and but that um to tell someone no there is hope there is possibility you it might not be the life you thought you were headed towards but um but realize hope that that, that it's possible to, to 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 embrace a life that maybe you uh, you never saw coming like i read i read psalm 139 and i'm, I'm reminded that um you know just the idea that it you know, gets used a lot in the pro-life movement that, that, that god knit us together in our mother's wombs he saw us when, when he formed us in our which what that means is though people come into this world through a lot of accidental unfortunate and even cataclysmic and violent acts that that no one's an accident yeah. You know, and that's and that's tremendously hopeful. Yeah. Um and, and to tell a person, yeah. no, no, um that person who did this to you and even you did not intend this. But let me show you how, you know, what Genesis, you know, fifty twenty says, what Joseph says to his brothers when he's finally face to face with them. He's in a position of power and they sold him into slavery. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. And to say that that's a possibility here and to be a part of that, right? That's so cool to be able to um another thing I got to do in Uganda was um, so we involved with involved with Comforter Center, involved with Heshima Ministry. Heshima Ministries is actually an organization that's based here in Houston. Um, it's and and they work with the team, work with the vocational training school in in Kampala. And then I also got to uh, go train, just go train local leaders, who um, you know sometimes the worldview uh, to help them see. Like remember we took just little um, microscopic like uh, models of what babies look like at various stages of development. You know, Billy Graham once said that if wombs had windows, abortion would be illegal tomorrow. Oh, yeah. right. um, to tell the story both ways. Mm -hmm. right. And and it was amazing to, to say, um, to see people saying, we didn't know our, our, our the worldview of our culture before this uh, wasn't, um, you know, didn't consider the unborn life because we couldn't see it, we didn't know it. When, um, but their ultrasound, ultrasound is transforming people. Oh, you can uh, hear the heartbeat, right. it really is live. Mm -hmm. But then to say, this, this is what your baby looks like. This is what it looks like, right? This is what it looks mm -hmm. like. We gave those those pins of a baby's feet at ten yes. weeks, right? And just to see them realize, this is you know fully formed. This is what mm -hmm. a human looks like at this stage. It's transformative. Awesome. Absolutely, it's very cool. Awesome. We yeah. also want to talk about. I mean, we could do these stories. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, for another hour. Mm -hmm. um, we also want to talk about uh, in rhetoric. We, uh, you know, you encounter your neighbor who's been out of shape at the Supreme Court, and they've got mm -hmm. their flag in their yard and their mm -hmm. sign on the thing and mm -hmm. you know yep. and somehow you stumble into the conversation that you work at texas right to life um <laughs> that, that was always the best conversation oh, yeah. so what do you do mm. where do you work yeah. what do you do for a living <laughs> well, well this is about to take a turn <laughs> yep but here we go mm -hmm. so yep you you have an opposing view and they're bent out of shape mm -hmm. yeah how um, do we start <laughs> well <laughs> well first off Again, remind yourself what the goal is. My goal is not to win. My mm -hmm. goal is to connect. My first, I'm going to connect with this person, and I'm going to try to win them over. Okay, but they're they're not going to be open until they're until they're calm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to how how can I connect with you? And so um, a lot of times when I meet a person who's been out of shape, I'll um, I'll let them talk a little bit, let them articulate their frustration, and find something I can agree upon. Like, cause there's something there, right? There's some there's some reason why. That they're upset, and and I have to assume they're a person of goodwill, mm -hmm. and so they they're so. And I'm like, man, I, I agree with you that that I don't like the government telling me what to do with my body. Um, I totally agree with that, man. I can see how that would be really frustrating. Um, what do you think is going on? How do you think? And and all of a sudden you have an opportunity to ask them a question, almost like 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 a Columbo tactic, a, a, a you know detective. Like I, I. So what do you think is happening with the unborn? Like you don't have to have the answer. But you know, if if they're if they're raising the question, then you can just sort of, you know, kindly, compassionately interrogate them. Like, okay, I don't, I, I'm not as upset about this as you. Mm. Tell me why you're so upset. And I, I just have this one question, right? Just um, one more question. Yeah. And like, what do yeah. you think? Of, what do you think is going on in this? Um, you know, because a lot of times uh, we we either become come off as combative because we want to win the argument, 
Um, a, a, a wise man told me one time, one, sometimes in, in situations like that, the goal is to diffuse the emotions and then to find a way to put a couple of stones in their shoes. Mm. Like mm. they didn't, ex they didn't come to the, they didn't come to their position overnight. They grew into it, and so they're not gonna get out of it necessarily overnight. They're gonna slowly come out of it, and the way they're gonna do it is by walking on some uncomfortable truths for a little while. And so find a way to put some stones in their shoes, so they're walking on it, going, you know, I just can't get, I can't, mm. I can't get away from this. Um, and sometimes it's one, just one little thing, right? And it can be just some sort of splinter in the mind that they just can't seem to shake. Um, and find it, and who knows what that is? It's it's always amazing uh, what um, you know what can be that kind of stone. But but that's one of the things I, I focus on. One of the one of the things is is once you realize your neighbor next door or or some colleague you, and you and you share an opposing point of view, sometimes you want to go on the offensive, right? There's a you know we talked about ethos, pathos, and logos. There's one rhetoric, rhetoric, rhetoric term that I love. Um, it's called kairos. Um, and kairos, so Greek has two has two words for time. I mean, we all know chronos, like chronological. Right. Kronos is the sequential order of time. Kairos means the right time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, and a lot of, and so understanding that, that maybe this isn't the right time for this discussion. Like mm -hmm. a lot of times we, we, we're, we don't understand the situation we're in and we start having a conversation that no one else is having or we have an argument that no one else is having or we try to raise an issue that no one else is raising and we come off as the angry neighbor. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. yeah, <clears throat> Kairos means understanding the situation and trying to ask yourself, is this the right time to have this discussion? Maybe maybe while our kids are playing isn't isn't the time to have a full-blown <laughs> philosophical discussion, yeah. but there is an opportunity right. to connect with you on an emotional level mm -hmm. or to talk about my credibility or to put a little stone in your shoe. The other thing is, um, the other rhetorical term I like to use is stasis or stasis. Um, okay. And it literally means the place where you stand. Um, it's obvious just from the, what the two camps call themselves that stasis is a problem in the abortion debate. Um, one camp calls themselves pro-life mm -hmm. and one camp calls themselves pro-choice. We're having two different arguments, yeah. okay? And so before you can have an argument, you have to make sure you're standing on the same ground and fighting about the same thing. And sometimes you don't get to determine what argument you're having. Um, and so if this person wants to talk about choice, sometimes you say, fine, if you're not gonna move, I have to find a way to come over there to your side and show you how I think that that is an important question, but maybe there's a more important question. Like the, um, and so that's what you do with, I, I'm just so mad about, I, I totally agree with you that uh, I hate it when the government tells me what to do with my own body. Tell me what you think the unborn is. Do you think that's that's the woman's body? Because I don't, I think I think there's a, another person there. And I think it falls into the the same category as child abuse. The government can't tell you what to do with your body, but your the right to swing your 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 fist stops at the other person's nose. I think, um, I think that, um, your right to choose is limited to the effects it has on other people. Mm -hmm. um, and then that something like that all of a sudden moves you into a place where now you're talking about the nature of the unborn, because that's the real question. Right. right. Mm -hmm. um, the, a friend of mine has a tactic he calls trotting out the toddler, um, which is <laughs> take what you're claiming to abortion is and the right to abortion and see if it works for a two-year-old. And if it doesn't, then tell me what the difference is. Um, tell me what the difference between, because that's, and, and that underscores the, the real question. Um, that's the question we're answering. You, let's talk about choice. I don't want the government telling me what to do with my own body. Um, let's talk about uh, equality and, 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 and abandonment and, and rape. Let's talk about all of the uncomfortable situations that cause people, how complicated sex can be and, how re, and reproductive and why God created the family. Um, but ultimately, let's find a way to zero in on this one question. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, because because it's, it's one of my favorite quotes. If the unborn is not a human person, then no justification for abortion is necessary. But if the unborn is a human person, then no justification for abortion is adequate. You know, and that's when you realize, oh, okay, there might be a lot of other complicating issues, but if this is a human person, then I'm, I'm stuck. And we have to make some uncomfortable decisions. Uh, a wise man once said, just because a situation is emotionally difficult, doesn't mean that it's also morally unclear. Right. Boom. Yes. Mic drop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So that's that's what I use rhetoric for to help people um, help people frame the frame the discussion, connect with people, uh -huh. um, connect with people, and and find ways of not just scoring points, not just winning arguments, but to redirect their minds towards uh, seeking the truth and, and finding it, and and realizing that um, like I'm I'm not here to and to force women to have 
Like I, I remember I actually went on a date one time with a girl who told me that I was I was racist for being pro-life. Like, re, re, I'm, you have to back that one up a little bit. Yeah. And, yeah. and she's like, well, because everyone knows that Southerners are pro, pro-life pro because they're trying to have force African-American women to have babies they can't afford to keep them in poverty. Everyone knows that. Like, that or, is or, the opposite. <laughs> okay, just let me just, let me start with an or here. Um, or I think that there is, um, there are two people here, mm-hmm. right? Uh, maybe that, maybe that's it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, um, but and so, how is, so there wasn't a second day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was interesting. But th- that that showed me like a lot of people have a lot of bad ideas, mm-hmm. and, and I was, I was, it's so easy to want to back the truckload up and defend yourself. But I'm going, how do I get this person to want to change their mind? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's where, OK, I, I maybe the first beginnings of my need to understand how you have rhetorical principles to engage people with these ideas. Yeah, so. for sure. And it's so important because we're not going to all of our gains aren't going to last unless we have the culture. So even if we pass amazing pro-life laws in every single state, they're only superficial. They're only here for now until the culture is with us and everyone recognizes that life is valuable and worth protecting. Exactly. You know, um, one of the uh, one of the things a friend, of mine, a friend of mine used is a term called, he calls ricochet evangelism. Maybe the person you're talking to isn't the person you're talking to. Um, because for every angry person who's willing to get in your face and shout toe to toe with your, with your, with your, um, about the facts, there's five or 10 people watching you. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and, and maybe perhaps the way you calmly and calmly, pre- maybe your, you, maybe your goal isn't, to change this person's mind, but to present your argument in a, in a clear, compassionate way, and it's going to bounce off this person. But there's someone else watching that it's for, yeah. And to, and to realize that that's that that's probably the goal. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much <laughs> for joining us today. I a lot to absorb. I love this. Like, is this the right time to have a conversation? Yeah. I will definitely keep that in mind as I encounter yeah. people who shall not be named. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> we all we all have you know Thanksgiving and Christmas and <laughs> right, things. Right. Oh goodness! But I I love the framing. I love the ideas here, and just leave a couple stones in their shoes. There, friends, there are hearts and minds to be changed, and now you have better tools to do it. So share this with your friends. Like, subscribe, share hearts and thumbs ups, and all those other things those Gen Z kids tell us we're supposed to do on these. Talk to your friends change some hearts and minds, save some lives, and we'll see you guys next week.